been asked this time to just give a brief introduction to uh, some of the ways that we engage people uh, in a very broad sense in, in Torb. And uh, then after that, uh, we'll have, uh, I hope, lots of uh, discussion in an informal way. So, so thanks very much. And uh, we're all having a, a cup of tea or coffee. Hmm. So if you could uh, slide to the next slide. Uh, this is just to give you, a, you know, a, a few brief uh, examples of what it looks like here. And it's, it's true, it's, it's just a small village. It looks a lot like uh, many other, vi other villages in, in Denmark. And most of them have a depopulation. I'm sure you know about this from, from your own country. This uh, particular village is one of uh, what's called a hot zone, a warm zone in Denmark, which is part of a, in fact, part of a, research project in Denmark, which is why do some of these villages actually grow? Uh, there is no particular reason why some of these villages should grow and most of the others should just uh, dwindle. So this is one of three uh, warm zones, hot zones in Denmark with a growing population. And we'll try to see whether some of the things that we do here might be helpful in that respect. So we just slide to the next one. Just to put, uh, put two up on the map, uh, as you probably know, Denmark is uh, close to Sweden on the one hand and surrounded by a lot of water, lots and lots, in fact, hundreds of islands. And in one of the islands, we have the uh, Copenhagen corner and we're on the opposite, the opposite end, end of that. Uh, it's uh, considered to be one of these uh, rural areas, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> also, one of the uh, local action group areas, which is really interesting because uh, the local action groups uh, are designed by the EU to help uh, local areas in, in distress. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, one of them here. Torv is a, a rare example of, of uh, a village that is growing, whereas most of the other places around here are not. But this is where, this is where we live on a peninsula, sticking out with the fjord and the southern side and the ocean on the other side. And we'll take the next slide. <clears throat> um, we were in fact chosen to be the national village of the year in 2019. Uh, this is a, you know, an honor and it also comes with a bit of money. Uh, but it was uh, that particular year, it was because of the, uh, the, the theme of the year was sustainability. And I've explained that earlier that we actually uh, work uh, on that concept and along that concept. And we have at least four dimensions, the uh, ecological one, the economic one, the, the also the, the cultural one <clears throat> and the social one, which are all four you know, dimensions in, in sustainability. And we, we, we work along those lines. But it's interesting that uh, you're chosen to be the national village of the year between you know hundreds and hundreds of other villages and it puts a lot of uh, spotlight on our particular village and i've been uh, traveling peter plant on tour uh, since then uh, with the <laughs> with the story about tour in denmark and elsewhere and it's interesting that you know uh, becoming number one is interesting for people uh, Whereas we were actually number two a few years later, and that was not interesting at all. This is just a small uh, map of, of this particular little village. And you might be able to see there is something in the center of the, of the picture here called the Dusikila ST station. And that's an important one. In fact, we do have a train line and, and the, the train runs uh, four times uh, an hour. So every half hour, there are trains here. And that's very important because uh, we have a school with over 100, 120 students and at least half of them actually use the station. And also we have, pen, we have people who commute back and forth. So this particular little station has a traffic of about 400 people every day, every day back and forth. And that's really very important. But we have to fight for this. Uh, the train company uh, would like to uh, make, you know, uh, some kind of reduction, uh, take out a few trains and that sort of thing. So that's part of the political, the part of the political struggle around here to keep uh, and to maintain these, if you like, public services. And I'm sure that you have the same with buses and 
I've seen also, you know, taxi services that in some countries you have to provide. It's really interesting and also important that we, we have these kinds of services. But I made a whole list of all the stuff we have going on here and you can read for yourself from railway station through school, kindergarten, down to farmer's market and local council. We'll revisit some of those. So perhaps the next one, Edina. <clears throat> One thing I've been asked to talk about today is our local council. Uh, we call it uh, Tink, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but you can see here that that kind of idea to sit on stones, uh, which in fact is what we did since the medieval times, is what we've been uh, revisiting here. Uh, so we do have, in fact, uh, what's called a Tinkster, which means a parliament. And our national parliament, in fact, is called Folketing, the people's thing, people's thing. So that particular concept is used widely in our society. And I've shown here, uh, in fact, uh, a small picture from about uh, the 1500s, where people sat likewise, you know, and discussed local matters. So in our case, we have 12 stones and we use them for all kinds of meetings, sometimes just uh, to use them as a table. Sometimes we use them to stand on or sit on, and we have uh, walking local meetings that would start from this particular point. And it's a lovely point. The sun sets over there, and it's a viewpoint. So uh, we've, we use this for all kinds of things, and I've seen that youth also would gather here. So it's, a, it's interesting. It's just a stone circle, that's all. And, uh, you know, put there by voluntary work. Uh, Bo and I, with a local tractor, got the stones from the local farmer and put them there and that's it. Uh, it's not very complicated at all, but it's a simple and we use it also in practical terms. So let me talk about uh, what this local democracy uh, might imply. Let's see what we have on the next one. First of all, there's the uh, origin of, of, the, of the actual word. Um, and it's interesting in the English language, we do have this thing, uh, which means of course objects. But in, in Old Norse, uh, to tinge, uh, which also is used in Icelandic, thing uh, means to negotiate. So it, it means to uh, sit down or whatever, uh, and to have some kind of uh, democracy going on, local democracy. That's, that's what it is. And that's why we actually use this word. But it also plays on words, it plays on, plays on uh, ting, which means object in Denmark, in Danish but also means to negotiate. But this local democracy is in fact, uh, some, it's a mechanism for, for, for um, coordinating what we, what we do here. We have open meetings where everyone can join, everyone that's in the local area. And, and funnily enough, also people who feel attached to the local area, but mostly it's uh, just uh, local people. And with a population of 356, we usually, we're usually about between, uh, you know, 60 to about 90 people, that sort of thing. And quite often we have some kind of topic which is central for that particular meeting. Uh, usually we had uh, local um, uh, excavations, we, we've had uh, traffic, uh, we had uh, local planning. If, you know, we, we try to see whether there are some kind of topic that might be of particular interest. We've had quite a few uh, meetings which were about the kind of research that's going on uh, around and in this village. We have, you know, universities studying us and they come back and, and tell us about their findings. But you can see from this list that we have a lot of things going on uh, as part of the local democracy. And uh, we have subgroups, we call them small things, uh, smutting. And you can see from this list here that we have repair cafes, uh, uh, Dogby, which is uh, on uh, small films, we have event coordination and so on. So if you're interested to, to look into this, perhaps we can discuss that later. But, but it gives you an idea that we have some kind of framework uh, around the local democracy and the bottom one, the, the municipal link is very important. As this is in fact, our, we talk with one voice uh, when we talk with the municipality. And I, we have regular meetings with the mayor of the municipality, which is a much bigger unit with 36,000 people, which uh, the mayor remain, reminds me that we're only 356 and he has the <laughs> much bigger kingdom of uh, 35,000 people. 
But if you want to discuss local democracy and how we operate in this area, uh, please come back and we'll talk more about it. And we'll take the next one. <clears throat> but one thing that we actually do in, in engaging communities is that we, we join forces. And I'll try to see whether we can get into some of these examples. This is just one concrete example. And I'm sure that your uh, villages, uh, in some cases, would look a, a bit like this. This is the old railway railway building. And this is what it looked like when, when we took it over. It's been neglected for years. You know, very few window panes. The roof is leaking. There are rats all over the place. And somebody has been gathering all kinds of junk that needs clearing up. In this case, there was 35 tons of junk in and around the building, which was cleared out in about a week uh, by voluntary work mostly. Uh, and again, that's perhaps a, a good example of working together. So let's see what it looks like when we've finished. This is uh, a, a bit later, but uh, we restored this over a period of, of 10 months. Behind that, of course, is uh, all kinds of uh, of joint ventures uh, and joint efforts. So in terms of money, private funds, crowdfunding, a big fund, which is called Readenia, but also uh, the LAG, Local Action Group, and a lot of voluntary work. Together that uh, formed the basis of what we have uh, in and around the station just now. And it's just a small station. It's 150 square meters, that's all. Uh, and it's a lovely old building from 1916, and it's sister building just down the railway line. It's just been pulled down because no one wanted to maintain it. So we have a tour of book town, which is secondhand books. We have offices on the first floor uh, with five uh, local workplaces. We have a farmer's market. We have a common garden. We have alternative transport and the repair capacity for the recycling, all that in and around the station. So instead of just being a, a ruin and being neglected, we've actually turned this into an asset. And this is a, a nice example, I think, of how we work with joining forces, um, securing the money side, as it were, but also setting up an organization. Behind this is a, a limited company, of which I'm the chairman, by the way. Uh, and it means that we also have the, you know, the legal framework to actually work in this area. And we're just taking this as an example, and you might be interested in in trying to uh, you know, look into this and see how we do it. And that you might also come up with some examples from your own uh, villages. But yeah, there's more to say about joining forces. Uh, crowdfunding, the bottom-up action approach, and the actions of civil society, in our case, has created uh, on the top left-hand uh, restaurant, which is where Edina is, <clears throat> but also a, a shop and a bakery. Uh, the assembly hall, the local school, uh, the local kindergarten, and lots of other activities. In this case, I've taken the market with all the wonderful vegetables and the repair cafe. And I'm sure in, in your villages, you have similar things. This would not have happened. Not, nothing of all this would have happened if we hadn't taken a bottom-up approach. This is civil society taking an action or two or three or four or five. And you need to have the, you know, the self-confidence uh, to do this and be able to organize it. Uh, that's a lot. But also you need to build up an, a long tradition of, of, uh, of taking the action yourself. And that these buildings and these people are examples of that. And if you want to discuss that more, you know, the role of civil society, it's one of my hobby horses. So you feel free to go into that discussion. Let's see what we've got. Because I've actually taken one concrete example of, of uh, uh, local development and recent development that might be of interest to you. How, how do we actually do this? Um, we bought an area which is about five hectares to enlarge the village. It's called Wieseland, which means white land. It's named after the, uh, the farm there, which was called white land. And you can see uh, that we, uh, di we've divided this area into A and B, which means it's uh, two sectors, as it were. We're doing this in, in two steps. So with all this, the five hectares all together, we'll welcome around 200, 250 newcomers. Behind this, 
is the initiative of Tor of Ting that we just uh, mentioned a minute ago. But we'd actually, uh, within that framework, created a fund, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, which means that we have a, a legal entity to, to take care of this. But this, in other cases, would have been some kind of, you know, capitalistic outsider who would buy the land and sell it off. And we've said, we don't want that. We will we'll do this ourselves, and we'll take this, the lead on this, and we'll actually provide some of the basics for all this so people can come to our area a lot easier than they would if they should start from scratch. Let's see how we've organized this because uh, it might be of interest to, to you how, how do we do this. We, we, in, in Denmark it's possible and I'm sure in other countries to create a, a local legal fund, a local uh, and legal entity. Um, and to do that you need to have what's called a ground capital, a basic capital, in our case, 40,000 euros. And the question, of course, is where do you get that kind of money from? In our case, it's crowdfunding again. It took us five weeks to, uh, to create that fund. And it means that a lot of us have put, you know, uh, some money into this, small sums, large sums. But it also perhaps gives you a, a nice insight into what a small village can do if people actually do this kind of thing together. Uh, so within five weeks, we had those 40,000 uh, euros and that made it possible for us to uh, go to the bank and say, we're, we're going to buy this farm, um, please can we borrow some money here? And of course the security in this uh, are the building lots and the farm buildings. All, all this uh, is, is worth a, a, a lot of money especially because we've actually uh, worked with the local planning. We, again, Tor-Ting, did the local planning. Of course, this is done in conjunction with the municipality, but we did 95% of the work there. So we wrote the whole local plan and put it on the table uh, in the municipality. And they, they, are very, they are very fond of these kinds of uh, inhabitants that can do a lot of the work for them. So in this, we've created you know, a business opportunities and the opportunity to uh, have uh, newcomers coming to our village. And again, if you want to discuss more how this is done and, and what the pros and cons of this are, uh, feel free to do that. But it's interesting that in this case, we've actually created a, a new organization to take care of that. Let's see what we've got more there. All this, of course, builds on a lot uh, of, of, you know, experience. Uh, in, in and around Torp, uh, we have at least 30 years of experience of doing things by ourselves. And I've shown you these uh, nice pictures from that part of uh, Torp, which is the Eco Village. So that's uh, 30 years of engaging experience. Uh, without uh, these pioneers, there wouldn't have been any school, there wouldn't be any kindergarten, and no assembly hall. So we build on a lot of experience and a whole, if you like, spirit of the village here. And I'm sure this resembles a lot of the um, other villages in Europe that we, we build on something which was already there. And let's uh, finish this off in a few minutes. One of the things we're doing uh, in this particular uh, Smart Rural Project 21 is this uh, IT support to tools and talents. It, it's trying to make some kind of overview of the machinery we have, but also the competences we have. Uh, and this is more particular to the, the Smart Rural 21 project. And uh, it's interesting that we have lots, everyone has a lot of machinery. We, we, we live on farms around here uh, and people have a lot of competences, but quite often newcomers wouldn't know much about this. And we have lots of uh, questions along these lines on Facebook, uh, which is where can I get some kind of help for this and that? And, does anyone have some kind of uh, machinery that I can borrow? Uh, and we're putting that into, you know, a more systemized framework. So that's what this particular part of the project is about. But to finish off, uh, just a few more. Um, one of the things that we actually do is to try to make rural life fun. And I've, I've sh I'm showing you this because, first of all, it's my lovely wife. But that's one thing. Uh, but we dress up uh, for, the, our, for our farmers markets. Uh, so every time 
uh, in particular my wife, but also I, and other people dress up to, to make it fun. And people are really curious, curious about this. What kind of stupid, funny, interesting uh, dress did Peter or Lillian dress up for this time? And it's linked to the thematic themes of, of that particular farmer's market, which is every second week during the summer. So the, the, the one to the right top there uh, is flower because it's, it's white and so on. And it's interesting that this is sort of a little, it's a little gimmick, if you like, but it's interesting that we can show people that actually it's good fun to live in rural circumstances. So we're all dressed up for rural life. Thank you very much. This is what the chairman looks like. Oh.